On behalf of the Cork Region of Engineers Ireland, I would like to welcome you to all this evening to our lecture on the recently opened Dunkettle Interchange Upgrade Scheme. We are delighted today to have four speakers. First, we will hear from Brendan Marr, who is the Senior Resident Engineer with Cork County Council. Brendan will cover the introduction, background and advanced works. Andrew Droney, project manager at John Sisk and Son, would follow Brendan to discuss the project delivery. And Connor Larkin, senior resident engineer for Cork County Council, will then review the communications aspects of the scheme. And finally, we'll hear from Tony O'Donoghue, who is the senior resident engineer at Jacobs. Tony will finish out with a piece on temporary works, uh, temporary traffic management, traffic flows, and project benefits and lessons learned. So over to you, Brendan. Um, thank you, Patrick. And, uh... Special thanks to the Engineers Ireland Park region and to uh, Roland and Maureen for facilitating with us this evening. Um, I'll show you a little bit on the background of the projects um, and something to, to talk about on the advanced works as well. Um, so we all know where we are. Um, this is a, the picture on the left side is what the scheme looked like back in 2019. Um, it's at uh, four crossroads here really. There are We've got the M8, the N8, uh, the N40, the, the Jack Lynch Tunnel, um, the N25, um, all converging in this one spot. So a very strategic position. We're about six kilometers or so here from the city center. You can see in the photograph on the left hand side there, that the two dots in the background in the city center. Um, so a very strategic position. So this again, just to highlight what the main arteries are coming from the Park Interchange. Again, an old photograph uh, pre pre the scheme. Uh, the M8 running north south in the interchange, the N25 uh, running on a flyover over the interchange, and the N40 coming out of the joining the interchange. So um, small bit of history on the area. Um, this photograph was taken back in 1995. Um, you can see, I hope my pointer can work here. Here we go. So you can see the old roundabout here, and this is the Glanmire uh, bypass and a section of the Glanmire bypass we built here to the east. Uh, there's been major road construction going on in this area since the early 90s, late 80s, early 90s, um, all culminating in the construction of uh, Jack Lynch Tunnel, uh, which opened in May 1999. And you can see here in the bottom of the picture, this is the uh, casting basin uh, for the Jack Lynch Tunnel on the south so bank of the of block uh, of Man. So um, again, just a photograph of the completed uh, uh, Glamour bypass. You can see at the time that the construction of the future in the five flyover and the tunnel that I'm here with the bank of construction and further down here, you can see the start of the Glow Pond uh, that has been constructed. Yeah, just a, a photograph of some of you might remember it. I remember it myself actually. We had a we had a visit to the site back in 1995 or 1996, some of the time around then. But these are uh, the tunnel segments we showed in the position. Um, and on the right hand side is the current setup um, of the Jack Hitch tunnel normal more so. Um, so what was the problem? Um, so as you can see here, uh, this photograph was actually taken during the advanced works. Um, and you can see that all the approaches to the to the Dunkettle interchange, um, they're all at capacity, as you can see. And all the exits, it seems that from this photograph are um, not being fully utilized. Um, this is again down to circulation of the roundabout, um, the traffic signals on the roundabout. So uh, the main problem here, of course, is trying to get 50,000 vehicles a day uh, through the interchange. And, and removing the signalized junction to, to help uh, achieve that. Um, also, um, something that often happened uh, during the construction period was the overhead vehicle detection on the tunnel floating down. Again, this causes a big backup onto, onto the network, to the north or to the south, whichever side it breaks on. Um, just a couple of more slides again, just to show where the congestion was on the first slide or the first photograph on the left. This is the N25 westbound. These were the old slip lanes which brought you down to the roundabout by the road to Dublin. 
or you were going to, into the tunnel to head on to the end for B. Uh, the middle one here was generally the case in the mornings on the southbound, uh, southbound on the M8 approaching the interchange. On the right side here is an old near Manning point. This is the end for B on the southern approach uh, to the Jack Lynch tunnel. So again, 120,000 vehicles a day, uh, pre-COVID levels. Um, obviously, during COVID, the levels dropped off dramatically, and we're just about, just before Christmas, getting back up to pre-COVID levels. So we estimate at the moment we're at about 120,000 vehicles a day. Uh, Tony's going to talk a little bit more about vehicle movements and volumes and incentives later on. So a uh, little bit of time on the project itself. So um, saying 2010 here that we commenced work on the interchange upgrade design, but there was some surveys and, and, and some options of works completed in advance of 2010, between 20, 2007, which is uh, you know, a little over seven or eight years after the tunnel opens, we're already looking at capacity on the interchange. We're looking at uh, upgrading the interchange. Uh, so, we published the motorway orders of the EIS back in 2012. Um, and in 2013, um, we got uh, approval for the Board of Canada to uh, issue the notice of the treatment that we should be granted. Uh, Technical advisor Jacobs uh, was appointed in 2016. And then we moved into the advanced work sections of the project. Um, so, as you know, the EIS, uh, ECI sorry, project to, to start with. So at the start, we were we had a clearance project and a, uh, an archaeology project, uh, and then John Sisk were awarded the main um, advanced works uh, project, the new risky project in 2018 to 2020. Well, we were looking at all the items uh, we could remove or mitigate against to try and uh, uh, reduce any type of, uh, type of delays on the main works. So we're looking at utility diversions, large utility diversions site investigations, uh, active travel, where we could possibly get uh, uh, pedestrians and cyclists on the way to the route, and looking at the approach capacity improvement as well, so junctions on the approach to the beach, which I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, so then, Kender uh, was awarded the main flux contract uh, in October 2020. Uh, and uh, so we started working with the main works in November of that year, and we had a contract completion date of March 2024, and we had successful completion achieved uh, in, in February 2020. Um, of course, this was just the last link uh, of the interchange opening in 2024. It was staged opening of all the various links throughout, so we have been opening links since, um, since early 2023. So um, just a bit of background on who was involved on the project. So our client was TII, our technical advisor was Jacobs. Um, our main contractor was John Systems Limited and the designer working for CIS for Phoebe Tinley, candidate civil consulting and brand dog. So I'm just gonna come back to this slide again for a minute. Um, it's helpful to point out some of the constraints associated with the location. Um, so a lot of junctions, uh, so you remember the old Ibis Slip, you know, what the whale skull is now, this was uh, the old Ibis Hotel and the Ibis Slip. Um, we have the, the Glomcon uh, on our fronts here on the eastbound of the N25. Uh, we also had the on-off ramps here at our slips uh, for Little Island or the R63 regional road, um, which feeds around the south of the island. Um, there was a slip as well off um off the park B, which we've been there past the tunnel management building and also connected up with um the R63 in the Lyman. Uh, also with Cork Middleton Railway line. And I just this blue circle here in the middle, in the middle is circulating start showing the you know the intertidal ponds, but there was a lot of environmental constraints. So we had you know, little egress, we had um, we had it at the pond, we had more flats, we had all sorts in this area. Um, Jack Lynch Tunnel, and of course, uh, Lock Man in Fort Cork. So, um, one of our colleagues put it uh, so eloquently like if you were going to build a large interchange, we wouldn't do it here. 
So um, moving on, um, this photograph I think was good just to show as well some of those constraints um, in the background. You see a lot of the large industry that's down in Little Island, yeah, Pfizer, San Up John, Royal Trust, and all these different people down there. Um, you can see the intertidal ponds to the left, and you can barely see one over here on the right side of the photograph as well. And um, obviously, this is the completed scheme. Um, but interestingly, uh, as well, on the cross section of this, just right here, this completed scheme, there are 12 lanes just on this cross section here, you know, as the different slip lanes and whatever else. Um, Parkland railway line, uh, uh, the lands of touch off again, uh, the construction of the rail bridges over the continent railway line. The right side, of course, the Jack Lynch Tunnel, uh, one of the main arteries in and out for the Long Park. And uh, you know, there's a lot of coordination with the tunnel because uh, the shuttle of the boards of the tunnel, it's a major incident and uh, the, the traffic implications are a lot more thinking about. So, uh, again, we talked about more of the coordination with the uh, people we're working So, um, with all those constraints in place, we look a little bit at what the solution would look like. Um, so, there was several um, solutions considered, and the final solution being um, the fully uh, uh, remove all the signals from the junction, so fully free flow, safety change. Um, with links connecting all of the major, major arteries to the other major arteries. So the M8 to the M8, the M8 to the M5, the M40, the M8, et cetera, all free flow. Um, it consisted also of a new uh, grade separated junction uh, to the east of the existing interchange. Um, so, uh, and, and, um, so, yeah, so uh, overall, I think, Approximately 10 kilometers of, um, of things that was constructed, part of property structures, four kilometers of, of culverts to connect all the intertidal ponds. Those will be a little bit more background. Um, so I um, just thought this was a, again a good photograph as a demonstrator to, so you could see most of the link roads together now in, in, in one photograph. Um, you have your off slips here for the eastbound traffic, the westbound traffic rather, feeding to Little Island um, to, to get to Dublin. Um, so there's dedicated lanes now for westbound traffic that could come slip off and head to Dublin. Uh, dedicated lanes for uh, the northbound traffic coming up to Dublin from Dublin and for the Borough City, all free flow and, and all traffic signals as well. All these kind of free flow diagrams are available on the Bonkhead and Traffic the website if you want to look at them. But here's just one of them to show an example. This is the free flow from the M40 or Jackman's Tunnel uh, getting eastbound on the M25. Again, uh, they can slip off and straight into the deployment. Uh, they also merge here with the M8 Sunday traffic. So um, it looks like in real life. So this these two mergers that I was showing you. So they they they, they made a southbound merger with the and part of the eastbound traffic to the east or heading to the drive and to the junction, whichever. So um that's what this new scheme looks like. Um a little bit of background then on our advanced works part of the scheme. So we we started advanced works in 2018 with the aim to really mitigate against any delays or time losses on the main works. So the main part of that was to kind of identify uh, service diversions, um, large service diversions such as large water or gas, et cetera, which showed us in 2007. Um, but in doing that, um, the specimen design had to be reviewed by uh, the contractor and his designer to come up with it, come up with a scheme um, and on the back of that scheme a lot of these diversions etc were, uh, were undertaken so um first of all here is this uh Irish water 500 million grams Irish water main one under the N25 north to south you, your bearings with the dust wells well in the background where this diversion is now is where you would slip off Coming from Middleton, where you slip off to get to the tunnel, what we call the interlazer. And 
and that last or that second last bridge before you come to the front is a, a large deck area on a bicycle bridge. So this is a copper dam that was sunk adjacent in 25, the dog is a version of uh, of the felt uh, water in but the work of the water and, and to get under the lake road and under the construction there. You can see here some of these uh, are supports for the construction, which is a great thing. And also, I don't have a slide but here, but the four uh, gas have a large developer gas main, which is to the east of the job and here on the south side of the job. Uh, so again, we were able to divert it, but it was protected by uh, introducing a um, spanning slab over the top of the, of the main. So it was piled on the other side of the main and slab over the top of the main. So the embankment, I think J for offset the little oil could be good to it. Um, some other services. So this is a service drawing, a complicated looking service drawing for the government. Folks to try and identify all the services on the scheme and just to mitigate against any delays and try and unexpected surprises during the main works. Okay, um, so also to the advanced works, um, the specimen point was taken both by the contractor and the designer and the moment they're on scheme and then to bash and they design for the scheme and a detailed design for the scheme in order to then specify what site investigations might be required and again mitigate against the day of specifying and doing those site investigations that started the main ones. So um the right hand side there and they might tell you a little bit more about it in a little while. Uh, the ground conditions here, you can see from the core box on the right hand side that a lot of core recovery, a lot of silt, mud, and uh, brain grounds. And compared to some of the photos, you can see there all of the coordinated in the work is fine. Um, footways and cycleways, yeah. So um, during the advanced works, the idea as well was that um, to try and take some of the cyclists out of the scheme. But while we're trying to construct the main scheme, um, believe it or not, um, you could sit at the time cycled in 25 over the flyovers or uh, uh, in east or west, but now that we put in a new cycle path uh, coming from the Duncan's house um, and diverging uh, north uh, adjacent to the MH, back onto the Glamour, the Long Town Road. So it allows you to get back onto the region of Bowen Road, you're thus taking the the uh, pedestrian or cycle south of the road. Uh, again, this is Brewery's Bridge, a uh, new cycle path bridge built over Brewery's Bridge, and uh, this connected in to the shared use facility that went from uh, Brewery's Bridge over that new interchange you see to the east of Tom Kettle and down to Little Island. So there's a dedicated cycle route right through there now. Uh, again, take a lot of pedestrian routes scheme. There's some of the simplicity of the left hand side there, but also what's shown here is this um, link road. I'll just go back a slide just for a second, you can see it better at the end of the link road here. Um, what's called the link, uh, link U, link with the double link T connecting um, typically around the boat up to the Glamour to the Duncan Road. Again, they were progressed as well through the advanced work stage. Mm -hmm. The idea of taking traffic out of the interchange during the construction phase or maybe some of the later construction phase uh, just to make it a bit simpler for ourselves. There was some work done in the Silver Street roundabout as well, um, as well as the bottom here, this is the queue, this is on the R63 down south of the line. Again, this one is up by the Wales Club. All these kind of uh, smaller junctions uh, remote to the, the main interchange were all upgraded and traffic flow through them in order to take some traffic out of the main interchange and construction. So um, I'm not going to read out all these bits of this slide, but it's just um, just to show you what was taken on board for the construction of the main works then. So like 10 clamps of link road I mentioned already, number of rail bridges, uh, 18 link roads, perfect structures, artworks, etc., etc., which will lead into Andy's partial presentation on the artworks and the structures. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Right, good evening, all. Um, I'd like to take the opportunity to thank Engineers Ireland for the opportunity to speak here tonight and hopefully share some information that I learned during the projects here. Um, uh, I'll do an overview of the geotech of uh, the project, pick out a couple of key points. There was a lot happening in the job, as you saw from some of those photos, and a lot of individual solutions, but I'll pick out a couple of the key parts that I feel would be important to know from it. Um, the background there that Brendan has gone through um helped us in some ways but also causes problems during the construction of the job so the, the history back here quickly is just a, a glaciated valley where um, it, the whole thing was removed out and infilled with a marsh of organic sediments um that varied in depth between 7 and 22 meters and then below that then was dense sands and gravels uh we went to 63 meters with boreholes we weren't able to find any rock so there was never an opportunity for using an end bearing end bearing solution on it and with one exception that would be the railway bridge to the north end of the site where it was the only opportunity to, to basically use uh, end bearing and um, I suppose all the various um, pictures that Brendan would have shown you of previous infrastructure uh, changed the properties a lot in the surrounding areas of those embankments where the surcharging um, from those um, embankments had a very varying effect on the different ground conditions around it which kind of made the, diff the difficulty then in a permanent works design afterwards and to predict the settlements uh, to be overcome. Um, the, I suppose the, the, the photo there, very similar to what Brendan put up, is the things I'd note from it is the proximity to water. Uh, so you see Lockman in the background, uh, Jack Lynch Tunnel, and then all the surcharging from the various different embankments and the various different depths made the predictability of settlement very difficult uh, to predict. And then one thing we noticed then as well was the river traffic when uh, our monitoring equipment would sometimes show spikes and uh, we were always monitoring tiny positions because of all the different connectivity and culverts and the different ponds you see on the picture on the right hand side of the screen there. And we were never able to make a synergy between why we were getting spikes in our presometers and our ground moving equipment that was around the Jack Lynch tunnel as showed movements of five to six mil from times. And just by look one day, we saw a large ship actually going up through the estuary that was being escorted by a tugboat. And it just happened that at that exact time, we were redlining on our movement equipment. So it showed you the influence and sensitivity of the ground when the water pressure from a boat going up the, the lock itself was interfering with our ground monitoring equipment. And um, services, what I suppose this um, drawing on the left highlights is the variety of the whole site. And not alone were we dealing with geotechnical uh, limitations. We also had the gas main um, that was on the right hand side of the left hand picture, which is the green line. And then the blue line is the 900 mil water main that is one of the key parts of the infrastructure for Cork City. And you can see the way that traverses the whole site at varying different angles, various different grounds uh, that had been constructed on previously and causes a lot of difficulty through the whole job. Um, there was various fiber optic and ESB cables in as well, and the settlement ranges we were getting because of the depths of the alluvium that, were, that we were dealing with for, uh, required us then to pile around these or CMC around them and put a door frame slab over them to basically take the load completely away from them or else they were just going to get pulled apart. We had existing culverts to deal with, so they had already settled over 20 to 25 years. So there's, there's loads of these arrows that you see on the left-hand side of the screen there all represent a piece of existing infrastructure, so there were numerous. They had all settled uh, various different levels and improved ground around them and some of them were um, undermined then during the works that we were carrying out so there was a difficulty then in predicting how to support them from a temporary works point of view considering the variability in the ground that we were dealing with and then we also had to be cognizant of program at all times so green areas there are where we used uh, vertical drainage so the pbds or vertical drainage or wick drains as uh, people often call them um, require a lot of time uh, to to one uh, build in um, uh, layers the embankment we built in 1.5 meter layers monitored the pore water pressure from the piezometers and then went to the next lift but the problem we had with the installation was all the previous infrastructure that had been put in had used large boulders uh, varying um, materials um, so basically the stitcher which you see the excavator on the left hand side uh, we used a 20 meter stitcher uh, on, a, on a 50 ton excavator, it wasn't able to penetrate the ground to get the drains in. So we had a layer of made ground over the alluvium, and we, which we couldn't get to. 
And that layer varied in depth anywhere between five to eight meters. And the problem, the way we overcame that then was we modified a sheet piling uh, leader rig on the right hand side of the left hand uh, picture. So there was a six meter uh, spike basically put on that. And the weight of the excavator, the excavator on the right hand side would be about 50 ton. That and the vibration effect that would be used to install sheet piles actually managed to displace the boulders and obstructions in the ground to make a path through. So basically the stitcher uh, had to stop when the vibration effect of the machine on the right hand side was happening, slew in, put in the drain, it retracted, then go over the next one. Um, so you see on the right hand side, the picture on the right hand side, you see the pattern there. So we opted for a 1.3 meter spacing. Uh, we've had problems in the past where we've tried to value engineering a little bit, uh, maybe gone out to 1.5, 1.6 centers. And that's that has proven to take longer and be a false economy in previous ground conditions. So we stuck with what we knew in this um, instance and we put them in at 1.3. And then on the picture on the right hand side there, then you see the drainage blanket that's put in afterwards. So the, when the drains are put in, uh, basically there's a drainage blanket put underneath the entire um, embankment, which we'll see in the next thing here. And basically that allows then, as the embankment is loaded up, the weight of that then is increasing the pore water pressure in the ground underneath. The, the path of least resistance is up through the wick drain. It gets into the drainage blanket underneath the embankment and then it extended out each side to basically drain the uh, pore water that comes up out of the, the soils. On the left hand side and the right hand side there, then you will see um, the uh, stability forms that were placed. Because the sensitivity of the ground, if we just loaded one part of the ground, the risk of a slip circle or failure at depth um, was always uh, very high. So to combat, to combat that, then we put stability forms outside our embankments. And on the on this particular embankment here, now you'll see more on the left hand side than on the right hand side. And the reason for that would be on the right hand side, it would have been existing infrastructure built previously, which would have surcharged that ground and strengthened it. Whereas on the left hand side, we were widening and we were building it um, into um, like a, a pond or into a soft ground condition. So we had to put a bigger stability forms out. So to build, to build an embankment, you had a lot more works to do than just build the embankment. And then the shaded area that's around the outside of it then is a surcharge that's put on. So our surcharge has varied anywhere between one and three meters. And the surcharge, we found that by increasing the surcharges up to three meters, the type of ground and the rate that the pore water pressure dissipated in, by increasing the surcharge, we didn't get a pickup in the dissipation of pore water pressure. Basically the water released at its own natural pace so by increasing the surcharge, didn't have any difference in it. So that was our basically learning curve that we had with the, with the alluviums. Um, CMCs then, where we had uh, very poor ground conditions, but we had a program constraint where we couldn't wait in vertical drainage to allow for the pore water pressure to dissipate, allow the settlement to happen. We opted for this solution here, which is a CMC, which is basically a concrete displacement file. So the rig you see on the left-hand side there, the company did it for us with Vibro Main Art. Um, it's used previously in Cork probably about 15 years ago, uh, and it had a failure. Um, one of its main limitations is it's not suitable for peat. Um, we were lucky enough, we were able to remove any peat or any organic material that's at the top. That's what you see in the picture on the right-hand side there. Any of the um, organic material was moved to the side. Um, working platform installed, which was basically a layer of geotextile, uh, 600 mil of 6F2, and then that was capable of supporting the rig, which was about 50 odd ton. Um, the mast then basically is a two stage mast. So that mast was a 10 meter mast. So we had to be conscious of the stability of the rig as well. Then by putting in a single stage mast, the rig, the ground wasn't actually able to hold the rig. It was that soft. So the 10 meter rig was especially made with a two stage Kelly bar on it. So basically it went in with the first stage into 10 meters retracted, cut the Kelly bar again, and then went in with the second phase, the, the depth that we needed to go. That then displaced the alluvium from around us, and then concrete was basically pumped in then the way back up. So that one, we were putting in a column of concrete, which has a known strength, but two, by displacing the ground around it, we were, we were instantly um, compressing that material and improving the, uh, the strength of the alluvium that was there. And then to further that again, then um, I'll show you in the next slide, um, is uh, we put vertical drainage in between them as well. So that then not alone uh, strengthened the ground, but it also gave a quick pass when we displaced the uh, alluvium with the displacement file to release all that water quickly. And then the, the uh, blanket we put in our working platform was our drainage layer as well, which you can see here extended right out to the ponds, left and right. 
So I suppose the thing to note from the photo then on the right hand side is you see the proximity of the works to the light traffic. So at all times then we were having to monitor the pavement of the existing uh, ground and we had to be very cognizant of the rate we worked at that we couldn't build or surcharge too quickly and interfere with the existing uh, infrastructure. But no one with the benefit was that we previous surcharging and construction of the N25 had improved those ground conditions from what we'd worked on. Um, to reduce down the footprint area then, um, help with program, help with costs. Uh, we're all in the age now of sustainability, reducing down the amount of concrete, uh, et cetera, fill material. We opted for steep and side slopes and a lot of the larger embankments. So basically what that is, is a geotextile retaining um, system where there's just a, a, a geotextile um, wraparound uh, mesh used with a hessian on the outside and um, 200 mil of topsoil on the outside to basically grow a layer of vegetation on the outside to stop weathering um, and um, aesthetics uh, for the future. So that reduced down the footprint areas of the embankments by 17%. So that had a knock-on effect in, be it program, be it uh, piling, be it earthworks, import materials, speed of construction, everything knocked on from that. And we were in a site where traffic uh, and material movements, we basically had a window um, pre half seven in the morning and then once four o'clock in the evening came basically materials, if they weren't on site, they weren't coming in that day because of traffic. So I kind of give you a, a general fill core in the middle and then a six I graded material um, on the outside. Um, that's the, the, I suppose the other thing there is just the blue, um, uh, layer that's underneath the embankments. When the CMCs are formed, you actually mix the top 600 mil of your um, working platform with the concrete. So you actually, to stop uh, point loading or punch and shear through your working platform, you actually distribute the, mix the stone and the concrete to basically, you're nearly forming like a, a, a poor man's pile head to distribute the load from it. Um, the steep and side slope itself, that's just a kind of a close up on it there. And then you see the kind of a picture of an embankment here showing what was happening where we were building on one side of an existing embankment to give us great flexibility where we could put in the CMCs over a footprint. The yellow then was the steep and side slope and basically you get straight into building our embankment without having to wait for any settlement. But it didn't interfere then with any of the existing infrastructure that was around us. Um, there's a not new, uh, that's a previous uh, project that's been completed. And it was there, it shows you the kind of modeling that has to happen at the back of a, of a bridge where you basically have to transition. Uh, all, our, all our structures were piled with CFAs uh, because of the settlement limitations that the TII spec for us. But then we had to transition out from that zero um, settlement back out to um, allowable settlement criteria back over about 20 meters to the back of the bridges. That's kind of giving you an idea of the modeling that was happening at the backs of the individual things. How we knew we were doing things right, we had a mixture of uh, piezometers, uh, extensiometers, and magnetometers. Um, basically, as we constructed an area, as we were coming up on the lifts, we were getting live um, results from all these. Um, our designer was looking at it, we were looking at it, and basically we could watch the pore water pressure dissipate in any of the areas we were loading, or when we were building embankments, when we were we had uh, CMCs or piling, we were very uh, cognizant of what was happening below our depths to make sure we didn't have any failures. Um, quick uh, overview of a few structures. Um, on the right hand side is, um, I suppose, the model of what uh, Brendan showed you there of the finish interchange in structure one. That's structure one kind of in the middle of construction there. So because of all the geotech that was happening at each side, on the north side of the bridge, you had a vertical drainage solution which required an, a transition of CMCs into the reinforced earth. The bridge then over the center of the carriageway was all CFA piles. So the supports you see there are all sitting on CFA piles. And in the south side of that bridge then, uh, believe it or believe it not, there was no ground treatment needed because the ground actually was better than envisaged when we actually went to construct it. Um, that, that bridge, that particular bridge then in, I suppose in the heart of construction, that was the copper dam. There was, was, there was 70, 80,000 people a day driving by this copper dam and probably didn't take much notice of it. So we basically maintained the dual carriageway either side while the um, existing uh, or the new uh, foundation for the center of support was uh, constructed. The, the problem with temporary works on the job was be, um, sheep piling was, I suppose, one of the solutions we used a lot along with sign laning. The problem we had with the main embankments was there was a lot of large rock fill in it which meant that we had to go out at night time and probe up to seven and eight meters with large excavators. We removed uh, boulders up three, four ton, did a lot of damage at night time. 
um, and basically infill that then again with 804 uh, very quickly and give it a light tamp of an excavator mounted vibrating uh, plate. And then when we set up with our leader rigged in, we knew we had our path through the um, uh, made ground cleared, no obstructions to get the sheet piles in the good line and the tolerances we had on each side with traffic, we couldn't afford any variances. Uh, the CFA pile piling was always done from ground level and we couldn't accommodate the rig with any kind of um, space limitations we had to lower ground or move carriage wells left or side because we were in the centre. And then I suppose on the right hand side there, then you see all the major licks that were happening were happening at night time because we were over sailing lanes, the size of the crane you set up. So it was quite a, a tight window setting up a 750 ton crane at half 10 at night. It wasn't ready till half. Uh, 12, you have probably had a three hour window and then you had to be getting it uh, de rigged to have the road opening in the morning. So everything was kind of uh, pressurized. That's similar photo to what Brendan showed earlier. That's the completed, um, uh, completed interchange there. So you kind of see the proximity to the water, you see the, the, the large earthworks uh, embankments at each side. And I suppose all those are built on. Uh, very, very soft alluviums on the right hand side where the bus is there, you probably have 23 to 24 meters of basically a liquid and that material couldn't actually be tracked on with any kind of an excavator. Um, it had to be stabilized as you moved your way into it. And I suppose to date we've had about 20 to 22 millisecond. So credit to, uh, I suppose, our designers and everyone that was involved in it. Uh, structure five was at the mouth of the Jack Lynch tunnel. So we had a big influence here on the tunnel. We basically broke out the uh, boat unit or anchor that the Jack Lynch tunnel was uh, um, anchored to when it was being constructed. So the pilot rig, the CFA pilot rig, you see uh, there in the, at the start of the screen there where the red dot is. That's the CFA uh, option that was being used on the structure. Then you have um, a PVD rig working here then um, in the area directly behind us. Then you had a, in the distance here, you'll see there's three other rigs then which are CMC rigs, uh, CFA rigs, and CMC rigs. So it was all happening uh, in a very uh, tight proximity of area, and the ground conditions varied dramatically then through that, where the rigs where the red dot are in the moment was an infilled pond, whereas these um, rigs that were working here in the foreground here were all old uh, sediment ponds that were from the construction of the tunnel. So totally different properties and totally different uh, sediment results, even over that distance. That's the completed structure five. So I suppose, Lucas, the roundabout that was built offline right beside the roundabout, and it was kind of an eyesore outside the, the project probably for about six months, and people were probably wondering what the hell are these lads at, but it turned out it's in the right place anyways, thank God. Um, so that shows the constraints in the construction. So you have a CFA rig in there with a 20 meter mast on it, and we were piling there to 18 meters. So the slave crane that was with us when we lifted 18 meter cages in that location beside a live roundabout that was taken anywhere I suppose five six thousand cars an hour like you know there was a lot of risk on the job luckily things went okay a lot of good people worked with us on it and then you see the kind of concrete truck trying to get a lot of concrete in to feed the, the concrete in the middle of the thing there was a whole logistics thing that had to happen in the foreground and then Pilot then was stage one. Stage two then, you can see the height the piles were at because the piles had to be installed from existing ground level because of working conditions. So you see the depths down then that we had to break piles. Uh, test piles, we were very limited locations where we could put them, services, etc. And then you see the difficulty again, main ground, the proximity to the existing embankment, trying to get everything constructed in a very tight space. Uh, that's, I suppose, two of the most difficult structures we ever built were structure six and seven, which are the two finished structures there, which was basically a widening of the existing um, uh, embankment. Structure eight then, which is the railway bridge. Um, we talk a little bit later about this, but just from a geotech point of view, we have a CFA rig in here, working 1.4 meters off the railway line here, installing 32 meter or 1200 diameter piles. Then you have a leader rig working here then, the leader rig here, so we had to build a platform and then we had to install the piles here because basically the, the bridge had to be constructed in two phases. So if you look at the photo on the left hand side here where the crane is set up, that's the half of the bridge constru getting constructed while maintaining the M8 live here. Um, limitations again then, so down here at the bottom left here then is the uh, pumping of the deck at night time. Um, we had Irish rail constraints, we had M8 constraints there, and then I suppose a good overall picture here of the M8 which I suppose, look at a lot of people coming up the Ibis slip road here, as you mentioned it, I said, 
every morning they came uh, wondering where they were going next because we were all the time constantly moving it around while we were building another simple bridge over here and, and getting ready to demolish this bridge here. So that's the old bridge as well. So we actually demolished that bridge as part of this. So it was 25 years old and extremely well constructed and it put up a fair fight to take it down. Uh, so that's the finished structure eight. So I suppose, look at this, maybe not that obvious there now, this was phase one here. And then basically the new half here then is the bridge that was constructed and you see in the background structure uh, nine. So I'll hand you over to Connor now. Um, good evening, everybody. Um, I'd just like to share the sentiment of the lads and thanking Engineers Island for the opportunity to speak here tonight. Um, I'm going to speak about the communication system. I think, as the lads have so eloquently put it, they've given a bit of an insight into what had to be done and the, the constraints around that. But I suppose, from our point of view as well, we had many stakeholders, which the lads have spoken about and Tony will speak about afterwards. Of course, one of our largest ones was the travelling public. And just to put it into some context, and as could be seen in some of the slides there, we were retrofitting the largest interchange in the country while facilitating over 100,000 vehicle movements per day. So it's just it's just to give some context of what had to be what had to be done. And I suppose when considering our communication strategy, we had to be aware of the potential impact on people, on the on their journeys and on their time. We had to be sure that people were aware of what was going on. We, we just had to make sure that that information was out there. And most importantly of all, it had to be factual information. It had to be correct and it had to be up to date. And I suppose because in its absence is how rumours manifest. And we all know where that can, can take us on a scheme of this size. So our communication strategy encompassed a number of specific elements. So we have the project website. We had a weekly newsletter. We had a dedicated traffic app. We had our social media engagement and we had good old email address. So I'll just run through these now briefly on some of these. So to start off, we had our project website. Standard enough on most uh, major infrastructure projects. Um, dedicated website with general project information, details of proposed layouts, uh, shed uh, scheduling of the works, frequently asked questions and a fairly substantial photo gallery. Um, I suppose the most important thing about the website is to keep it up to date, because as you know yourself, a website which is not up to date is worse than no website. And one thing to highlight just about our website is we did have links to our newsletter and to our traffic app, which I show you there, which I, I'll speak about in a minute. Um, we all, another element that we undertook was the provision of a, a newsletter. And the newsletter was, we were, this was where we allowed the members of the public to sign up to receive a weekly newsletter. Um, which was transmitted by email at 12 o'clock on a Friday. And the main purpose of our newsletter was to keep people up to date and keep people informed. What's happening? What happened this week? What's going to happen next week? Is there any road closures? What are the diversions of the road closures? Is there any other disruptions? Is there nighttime works? The main purpose of all of this was allow people to plan. It was just to give people the opportunity to plan that if they had something specific coming up, and they needed to adjust their travel plans that they could they could plan it. Um, it got to the stage where our newsletter was. We I suppose we got a lot of we got a lot of correspondence. Um, you know, complimenting us on the newsletter that people enjoyed it, and some from people waiting for it on, on a Friday to just see what the update it is. Because there was a, there was a certain amount of people that followed the project on a week by week basis. I suppose people passing it every day, and people that would just have an interest. Um, certain social media outlets then may use our 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 uh, newsletter that would be published at midday to form basis of their own articles, which would be of assistance to us. Say, for example, we closed the road between the between the interchange and the Tivoli roundabout on a Friday night and on a Saturday in order to get a specific section of work done. And some social media outlets picked up on that and ran stories, which was great for us because it it just got our story out there to a wider audience. Um, we had over 3,000 subscribers to the to the newsletter, but we know that it went a lot further than that, because we were aware of IT companies and pharmaceuticals and even some businesses in the Little Island area who might register one address. And then when they had received the newsletter, they would circulate it to all their staff. Same with some of the academic institutions in the city and 
just it was a great way of getting getting our message out. And um, we actually issued over 260 of the newsletters over the course of the work. Um, so just on the newsletter, one of the highlights of the newsletter was the use of videos. And be a drone footage of unfinished links or proposed diversion routes. The videos were really good. And the lads showed them some of you on the previous slides. But just by way of just, just to show you, that's a screenshot from our newsletter, which will come off some drone footage where we labeled all the roundabouts and all the links to indicate where people were going. And where the videos had a huge impact was where we um, we'd, we'd a major opening of seven links on one weekend in July of last summer, uh, which coincided with the turning off of the lights and really highlighted the change in function of the roundabout. But just by way of example, on, on, on that weekend, we prepared videos of all the links and the movements of how the traffic was going to move. For say, for example, there under the new regime, when you come out of Cork City and to get into the tunnel, as the lads had shown on a previous slide, you had to go over Link Hep, round the corkscrew, as we call it, round the loop, and into the tunnel. And associated with that, we also um, produced drive-through videos of all of these movements. Just to give people, before it changed over, just to give people a bit of a look to see what way they'd maneuver the roundabout, the interchange as they went about their business. For that weekend, we prepared 10 separate videos of the of the different movements around the roundabout. And actually on that weekend in question, there was newsletters went out nearly every day and sometimes twice a day, just to keep, again, just to keep people informed. And all of our videos, which were on our YouTube channel throughout the course of the job, had over 500,000 views. So which was great for us as it, we felt it got the message out. Um, in parallel with the newsletter, we developed, developed a dedicated uh, traffic app, which provided full up-to-date journey time information, as well as, well as real-time video footage of the operation of the, of the interchange. Um, again, the main purpose of it was to allow people to plan. If you were planning a journey and you're coming in, coming down from Dublin and you wanted to go to the airport, go onto the app, check the app, see what the time is like. If there's no delays, I'm okay. Or there's something causing the problem, I need to leave a bit earlier. Again, just give people as much information as problem. I suppose there's nothing worse than coming to the back of the queue and not knowing what's going on. And, you know, to have no information so the purpose of the, the app was to get as much information out there as possible. Another, another um, highlight of the app really was the provision of the cameras that are based down around Dun Kettle. So the cameras were, are the, you could click into the app onto any of the cameras and it would give you a feel for the real time situation. So like for instance, there, I went to, that's the infarct there outside the window of the hotel here. That camera there goes back, it shows you way back towards Kinsale Road, uh, Road roundabout. So if you checked your app and you, you saw that there was an issue and you might decide, do you know what, I'll come off at Kinsale Road and I'll go in through town. And again, it's all about just keeping people in, informed and giving them options to allow them to plan. So we were very happy with the outcome, but we got some great feedback of it. We had over 10,000 downloads of the app. And we understand that the intention is to use it with the M28 works which are to follow. Um, again, just on the social media side, we wanted to ensure that our message reached as wide an audience as possible. So we, we set up a Twitter account. And there's just some examples of some of the other Twitter accounts that we would have uh, we might have tagged, you know, when we were sending out messages where they would have re retweeted them, which again just spread our message. And sorry, just one other item that I forgot to say. On the app, one another great advantage of the app was that if something did go wrong, as the lead spoke about, if there was an overhyped vehicle or if there was a crash at Mahan and it caused things to back up, we were able to send out a notification on the app, which would instantly tell people there's a traffic delay and just proceed with caution or replan your route. But that message also got sent out on our Twitter which again increased the volume of people that were able to, to see it, which again was very beneficial to us. We had, of course, our email communication. We established a contact email address, uh, which allowed people to send in queries and any comments they had or any concerns they had about the work, um, which was 
This was led by the client's representative with input as required from the contractor to different issues and the watch issues, which we dealt with as soon as we could. And that was one of the main that was one of the main um, objectives of it was to respond on time and to give people that information that we could. Um, I suppose over the course of the scheme, we did get a lot of positive feedback on different elements of the work, um, which are always good to get. And it, it, it always came through in the emails for, where we got loads from, from members of the public. This is just another part of our communication strategy, just to show you there, just uh, another idea we had where we developed a scale model of the works. And we had this from before when the job started. Very useful for when people call into site, and especially at the early stages, as some of the slides showed, where you might see where a road is going to go or how am I going to navigate the, the interchange. So we had that in the office and we used to regularly put up on our newsletter to if there was any queries, please come in and, and see the model. Um, very useful with some of our neighbours calling in um, and schools. We had a lot of, a lot of school kids would have come in to see it. And in advance of that open that we did in July, we actually took it on tour and brought it down to some of the industries in Little Island, set it up in their foyers or in their canteens, and just staff who were living in, or who were working down there mainly, um, just so they could get a feel for when the, when the layout changed, what um, direction they're going. But again, very positive, very positive outcome with that. Um, just to move away from the public element then of the, our communications, another initiative we developed was the establishment of a traffic forum. And the traffic forum was established by TII and Jacobs in advance of the construction work commencing on site. Um, the initial objective was to set up a forum with the emergency services and with the local authorities um, in the context of access to and through the site in the event of major, major instances. Um, it then developed into a forum where we had Arto, who were operating the tunnel on behalf of TII and each of the motorway maintenance contractors. And from there developed in Ishkair and became involved with their works in and around the location. And certain in the industries, some of our neighbors joined the traffic forum as well, just to hear what was going on and if they had any input to, um, to add it to us. And when CIS were appointed, then they fed into an already excellent communication system, um, which had developed for the for the greater area. Um, it is the intention, I think, to run the safety or the traffic form in, in some shape or form for the M28 works as well at, at, at the appropriate time. And over the course of the works, we had over 70 traffic forum meetings. Um, so just to give you a little bit more insight into communications and with some of our stakeholders. It's very obvious from what the lens showed you there, how tight the whole site was and how everything had to be done in collaboration between the client, the client's rep and the contractor and the stakeholders. Um, so for instance, the ERTO, the operators of the Jack Lynch Tunnel, there would have been four nightly meetings with them just to keep everything in order and just if there was any issues that could, they could be dealt with in a timely manner. Aegis, who were the motorway maintenance contractor as well, very collaborative, and we would meet as required. And I've just put in there Beatrice, who was in one of the was was in one of the photographs there as being an adjacent um, pharmaceutical company, where we would have had a lot of interaction with them, and actually set up some dust and noise and vibration monitors in their property, um, which provided real time information both to us and to them, with the with the goal of ensuring that there was no um, disruption to their manufacturing. So just some other key stakeholders, of course, our neighbours, very important, and the schools. And even for our neighbours and the schools, we would have done local letter drops. We would have kept them up to date with things as they were going on. And I've just listed a couple of the other um, industries there that we had a lot of interaction with. Um, as and we spoke about their we had a lot of the, the Tide and the OPW with a lot of interaction with them. Air Road Air, which Tony will cover now in the in, in his side of the, side of the presentation. And of course, our utility providers. And I suppose from a, uh, from a communications point of view, just to mention to Cork Chamber and to Little Island's Business Association, who, if required, and we wanted them to put out a, a specific message, would have sent it out to all their members, which would again, would have increased our our reach, which is, is what we wanted. 
Mm -hmm. Right, so just one very quick slide there on the intelligent transport systems. The intelligent uh, transport system, which is based on our own Dunn Kettle, I'm sure you're aware of it, basically to enable key information to be provided to road users and to enable TII to strategically manage the national road network in the area. Um, I suppose its objectives are to provide driver information regarding journey times, um, provide improved overhead vehicle detection, uh, given our proximity to the tunnel, and to provide driver warnings, you know, be it weather, spills. I suppose the picture on the right there just shows that there a uh, lorry had shed its road after the junction. And it's just information to make people think and to slow down. The ITS on this scheme went in in a couple of phases. First off, you had the ITS, the gantries were implemented on the N40. Then there was an advanced Dunn Kettle scheme where on the approaches from the M8, the N8, and the N25, some of the gantries were installed. And the current, the current uh, phase where the ITS has been integrated with the ITS of the main works, which is ongoing. There's also AMPR cameras, CCTV uh, cameras, and there is some barriers to go in that will direct you away if you set off the overhead detection. Some of the ones that were put in as part of the advanced works were in use during our works and which were a very good benefit to say if there was new road layouts ahead and they worked very well and will hopefully work very well on into the future. Um, so just to sum up there from communications, as I said at the start, just get the information out there. We couldn't do it without some form of disruption both to try and minimize it as much as possible and get the people the information. So just to summarize, we have 70 traffic management forums meetings. We should over 260 newsletters. We had over 3,000 subscribers to the newsletter, even though we know that was much, much higher. We had over half a million views on the web page. We had over 10,000 downloads of the traffic app. Uh, we had our dedicated email address. We had our dedicated project, our project website. And we had our ded dedicated social media presence in the form of Twitter. And we said, we are very proud that the work was completed with minimum disruption. And we're very proud of the role that the communication strategy played in that. So I'll hand you over to Tony there for his section. Thanks very much. Yeah, thanks, Connor, and thanks once again to Engineers Ireland for hosting us here tonight. Um, my name is Tony O'Donoghue, and I'm going to take you through some temporary traffic management, uh, traffic flows, and benefits of the project, and um, some lessons learned. Um, now that we're at the, the tail end of the project. Um, so the first slide here so is a tra traffic phasing um, slide here. So basically to show us the green indicates um, at this stage, um, the question is uh, the route that was open, the red highlights, the route that's about to open. I suppose the, the whole phasing has to be coordinated, obviously with the program and with um, temporary traffic management. And one of the key, uh, constraints of the works was we have to maintain two lanes open in the circuitry carriageway at all times as far as possible. So that just to make sure we minimize disruption to traffic and um, uh, kept the junction uh, as operational and, and as uninterrupted as possible. Um, these um, plans were developed with the blue light services, as Connor mentioned, the local businesses and motorway men. Uh, maintenance contractor and ortho the tenant uh, tunnel operator. And this just gives you an idea of maybe one of the more complicated switches that would um, would be communicated in the run up. Um, so the the red and pink lines indicate um, new links that are about to be opened. The orange hatched area indicates an area that's about to be uh, decommissioned in effect. So that's the exit slip going eastbound for Middleton. And um, it just gives you an idea of the traffic management and the, the level of communication you have to um, cater for. And I suppose you have to maybe have an understanding and appreciation that not everyone is in the construction industry or has a full appreciation of what is happening or what is likely to happen um, or the logical steps. So they just, they just need to be clear and concise uh, the message of uh, what you're about to do. So, Everyone's quite clear uh, before the fact. 
Um, again, just highlighting um, on strength and site uh, through the course of the project. And you can see on the left there, we've maintained two lanes open on the circuitry carriageway while we're building a retain wall behind um, the protection of uh, some burial guard. Again, on the right there, there's some embankment uh, improvement works widening happening here. Again, we're hemmed in both sides by loud traffic. Um, so that all has to tie in with um, a carefully coordinated and thought through um, every traffic management strategy, just to make sure access and egress is sufficient and it's safe, uh, both for structuring vehicles and obviously for the public. And again, this just kind of highlights uh, how compartmentalized the project became. Um, and it would have indicated these areas before at Structure 5. We've got a PPD rig, CMC rig, a couple of um, excavators and attendants, uh, all in this small um, triangle here, and just uh, north of the tunnel. I wanted some piling works uh, by, by night. And again, um, just on the north of the circular carriageway, you can see the southern abutment here, um, point to here. But with the CMC rig, just very limited access uh, and space um, for the crews to get the work done. And um, just again, just highlights the coordination and the uh, foresight required just to make sure these things run smoothly and safely. And just to speak to um, the other traffic we have to care, care for is the rail traffic. But with the carpet and rail line almost quite safe in the job, we had to. Um, ensure we didn't disrupt the uh, rail services. Uh, so the, the, the longest um, positions were a weekend position. So the strategy for the demolition of the existing bridge here was to um, soft up it into segments, basically. Um, so the, the abutments were soft cut uh, with the diamond coated wire rope. And I think they were cut in the region of 70% of the way uh, through and then um, on the night of the possession, they were cut through and removed by crane. And you can see some of the segments stacked up here ready for concrete recycling, crushing. So it just gives you um, an idea of the complexities of working around uh, like rail lines. And just to speak to the success of it, like there was no delays or impact on the rail services, which is noted by the thing over there. Um, to take it through to the project benefits, I mean, it's the whole reason we've, uh, given the last number of years of building the job, um, is to improve congestion. So here are some of the um, stats given to us by our app provider. Now they have used Google Maps um, to estimate their the journey times, and at the outset of the job, we would have um, established nodes at. Uh, the approaches to the uh, project. So up there at Watergrass Hill, say for this movement of M8 to N25, uh, down to say Junction 2 on the N25, that gives you your M8 to the Lyle connection. Uh, likewise here and the, the city side uh, or the, the N40 node there is more or less at the Frankfield footbridge, uh, which has recently been put in there on the approach to the say road. And in the city, the node um, is at Silver Springs. So just to briefly run you through what's happening here with the numbers. And um, the gray here is the AM. Uh, so back in 2019, that route took 18 minutes, um, 18 and a half minutes. And in 2023, it took just shy of nine minutes. So 52% improvement in journey time in the AM peak. And in the PM, 21%. And follow the same. Uh, on that through uh, all the very through. So we've had some decent um, improvements. Um, it's not to say we've eliminated congestion, but we've substantially reduced congestion. Again, another a few of the main routes highlighted for N25 to N40. Um, so I suppose one thing to highlight here, I mean, the devil's in the detail with the data and how it is interpreted. So at this time, these figures, the 2023 figures are taken from January prior to the, the Dublin link road being opened. So that just meant that there was additional volume of traffic being pumped through Tivoli so that you can see the hotspots that they kind of stand out here, they're drawing here and Bloomfield here. So although say they're outside of the, the project extent, 
they are still measured here in these journey claims. So uh, at the moment, the ITS uh, works are ongoing. So there's traffic counters being installed on all links. So we expect to have more finite data and, and refined data on the improvements and the benefits of the project, probably towards quarter four there this year. So you can see again the, the improvements that, um, that have been achieved. And even from the app supplier, they are saying we're still getting month and month improvements because there's an element of familiarity for people. So not everyone's here every day. So as people become more used to their movement and it becomes a habit, uh, people flow through the smoother. And that all just aids to um, a shorter journey things really. Um, and this is, I suppose, the kind of the headline benefit. And um, just to take you through of what we've done here, so peak time duration. So this is basically how long does rush hour last? Uh, so how this is established is down here. So what they've done is they've taken um, a baseline, which is as quiet as it could possibly be. So 4 a.m. Sunday morning, it was measured uh, the journey time along the key routes and, and they're listed here. And anything over 30% increase was considered your entering peak. So just to demonstrate then above the improvements achieved. So, um, so 2019 AM peak versus um, 20, uh, 2023 uh, AM peak. So everyone would be familiar with um, the two hour queue um, in the mornings and having to plan for that, particularly on the M8, three plan for tailback. So it's gone from two hours, seven minutes down to less than a half an hour. And in the PM peak, it's gone from two and a half. So the average hour uh, is 58% of the reduction of, um, the reduction of the, uh, Rush hour uh, in a nutshell. Um, and again, these figures are taken from January before all links are open. So we do expect to see an improvement on this um, in the coming months. And um, just a, a mention on sustainability and recycling materials. So just to give you a flavor of uh, how the job benefited from these materials. So in the region of 135,000 um, cubes of class one, class two materials were imported uh, under Article 27, mostly from residential projects around the area. So from uh, Carrigaline, Watches Town, and uh, maybe further afield in say Middleton. Uh, average journey time less than 11 Ks or distance at least. And another initiative that um, Contractor utilized was HBO and some other excavators, um, which would be in uh, coating emissions. Um, I suppose one novel piece is the introduction of um, runway uh, planings. So, in I think around 2021 20, 22, um, during COVID, Cork um, undertook a, a runway maintenance um, program. So, they resurfaced the runway. And we were the beneficiaries of uh, in the region of two and a half thousand cubes of planings. So just under um, series 600 there. And those are mixed with um, natural aggregates and the farm 6F2. And that was used in the season slopes in the uh, raised embankments there. So that is uh, what so the major benefit of that is the carbon saving. Um, it's estimated that you're getting a um, 50% um, benefit on the initial uh, carbon output of the originally um, manufactured uh, planes or reduced materials. So um, that is an, a novel um, use of the materials. It just so happened it was happening at the, as the time it's worked out, but um, it was certainly beneficial. And you can see the materials there uh, stored there uh, ready for finishing and mixing um, with the natural aggregate. Uh, I don't know. Uh, some lesson learned. Um, probably going back to maybe some of the topics that Brendan mentioned. I suppose de-risking was probably the key to a complex project like this. And uh, the main thing being uh, diverting services early and engaging with the statutory bodies early. 
uh, getting laws um, uh, in effect out abroad in, in a literal sense. Um, site investigations provide as much site investigations to the uh, contractor archaeology, and there was not too many archaeology items uh, found, but um, obviously you still have to go through the process and to the real risk and to program um, if that spills into the main loss contract. And then obtain statutory consents where possible, so section fifties for culverts. Um, say in our case there was a, a reasonably established um specimen design. So I mean there's an opportunity to progress with with um section fifties and NCAs for structures and to basically get that um those timelines out of your program for the main works. Um Another one, actually, which might seem obvious, but um, a full assessment of existing structures. So we had a few existing structures to be modified. And um, I suppose when you do get um, a suite of drawings and safety files and whatnot, um, there's an assumption that all the information is there. That's not always the case. And um, for example, there was a case where there was a couple of beam drawings missing, so which meant a full assessment couldn't be done. And, as a desktop exercise, so truce of um, investigation works had to take place and they are costly and time consuming. Um, I suppose when, if there was a, an understanding that uh, you'd be able to do a, a desktop exercise in a matter of a couple of days to uh, curing a full suite of um, intrusive works, um, it's going to different happens. So, and that's one maybe to consider when modifying kind of brownfield sites and um, existing mm -hmm. junctions and such. And then I suppose just the early introduction of BIM, um, it's very much um, taking hold in the civil space. Um, it, you know, it's well established in the building space, but um, it, it's quite useful um, in terms of, even for the likes of ITS now, which is um, rapidly developing, there's a lot more equipment to be considered um, in and around junctions, for example, the overhead vehicle detection, you need sightlines for both those, your CCTV, and all those have to be coordinated with your signage strategy, just to make sure there's no flashes in sightlines with advanced restaurant signages, BMSs, structures, and whatnot. And as well, just the, an obvious thing, just to check for like your BRS, your overlaps in constrained sites, it really does help kind of um, brush out issues. Or, and as well, going back to the communication piece, a very useful um, communication tool um, to demonstrate uh, you know, new groups, uh, new infrastructure that's going to become available. And um, it just helps communicate to maybe the, the non-construction public very clearly and with uh, really um, high in graphics um, what's uh, to be expected in the coming weeks and months. Uh, again, this facts, uh, the figures and the stats of the job that Brennan mentioned earlier. So, um, yes, what the headline one is 120,000, up to 120,000 vacancies a day, and, and kind of rising. And um, again, I suppose one thing to consider is um, a post COVID um, fact is that the traffic is less even now. So, Mondays and Fridays tend to be quiet. And uh, Tuesdays tend to be exceptionally heavy. So there's an un unequal distribution of violence, which is uh, does make it more challenging uh, managing traffic. But it is a new phenomenon. But um, look, I mean, like I say, the, we achieved uh, substantial reductions. It was never going to be possible to eliminate con uh, congestion um, with the constraints that uh, existed. And um, it's your before and after. So your 2019 shot and 2023 shot is going to finish works. And here we are on the opening day on the 12th of February. So fun was here three, six weeks ago, really, I suppose. And so that was opened by a police shop, uh, Mayor Martin. Uh, and we got a nice bright sunny day for it. So um, no, it was well received by, by all the country. Um, and I suppose just to, out on it uh, on the project i suppose we're very proud that we were able to deliver and um, the project and um, with minimal uh, interruption for public i mean it's never um, going to be possible to have no interruption but for, for the uh, largest extent possible we're able to maintain traffic flows like say maintain the two lanes around the carriageway which 
wasn't easy and took a lot of planning by by six and uh, particularly and we're proud of how and um, the work uh, the finished product has delivered the substantial reduction in congestion and the uh, power team so uh Park County Council and TII uh, CISC and Jacobs came together and uh, worked collaboratively together to deliver um a really um a really great project um, for the area of Cork and um, yeah we're just really pleased of um how it's come together so I think that's a bonus for us.